Let's have a big hand for Ilya van Sprandel. Awesome. Okay. Uh, yeah, so as previously mentioned, my title is Are All BSDs Created Equally? A survey of uh, BSD kernel vulnerabilities. Um, to start off with who am I? My name is Ilya van Sprundel. I work for a company called IOActive. Um, I did spend the last five years uh, in America, but I recently moved back to Belgium a couple of weeks ago. Um, I, I'm a computer security consultant. I do pen tests, code review. Uh, I break stuff on a profit. Um, I've been going to the CC Congress since 19C3, uh, which has been a while, and I've spoken a couple times before. Um, I think this will be my seven or eight time. Um, and let's see how this goes. Um, right, so my presentation is sort of split into three, four ish pieces. There's an intro, which will be the next slide, and then uh, there's a little bit of data um, that I'll show, and then there's lack of data, so I want to test a couple of things, and then once I've tested that and I've got, gathered some results, um, I'll present my results and my conclusions. <clears throat> uh, right, so what does this talk about? BSD kernel vulnerabilities. Um, it's a comparison uh, between the different uh, current uh, BSD flavors. Um, as for what I expect from the audience, um, if you uh, uh, basically expect some basic Unix kernel-ish knowledge, not too deep, but, but some would be nice. Um, people that I think might appreciate this talk are, you know, if you're a low-level security enthusiast, um, if you're a USD or BSD geek, and then if you're a Linux guy, you might like this too. And then generally people that are curious about um, OS internal security, I think might enjoy this presentation. Um, <clears throat> before I move on, I have to mention, you know, some people that, um, I call this standing on the shoulder of giants because you don't do this by yourself. You build upon work by others. So um, there's a number of people that have uh, done interesting BSD kernel security research over the last, I don't know, decade and a half, maybe two decades. Uh, some of them might even be at the Congress. Uh, so uh, uh, Silvio Noir, a uh, bunch of others uh, that did some really interesting uh, work. Um, so really, uh, this, this presentation sort of started with um, uh, uh, a, a post to a mailing list years and years ago uh, by uh, Tio Durat, who, if you don't know who he is, is the, uh, the main guy behind OpenBSD. Um, and I remember reading this 12 years ago, and it's been sort of stuck in my head uh, since then. Um, and it's basically a quote from uh, Tio where he goes, you know, if the Linux people actually cared about quality, you know, as the OpenBSD people do, uh, they, wouldn't have, they would not have had as many uh, local root security holes uh, as they had last year, which is that year, which is uh, 2005, and Tio goes, how many is it, like 20 or so? Um, and so I think that was, uh, uh, you know, when he makes that sort of said, oh, 20 or so, I was like, really, you know, is that true? Is it, what's the data behind that? Can, can we look at some of this? Um, and so I basically started looking at, um, the last uh, almost 20 years of Linux kernel vulnerabilities and what the numbers are. And so I went to CV details and they basically keep a record of his stuff. And, and it goes back to 1999. Um, and if you look at it, you know, the first three or four years, it's, you know, in the teens. And then starting 2004, 2005, it sort of jumps up, goes up into the hundreds. Um, and then uh, this, actually, this, this table is from July of this year, so the 2017 numbers aren't correct. And so it, in July 2017, it was uh, 346 Linux kernel vulnerabilities, but as of today, because I checked earlier, it was uh, 434 Linux kernel vulnerabilities. Um, and so as you see, th these numbers are kind of sort of growing. Um, now, um, CV details doesn't have the same numbers for um, like BSD kernel uh, issues. They have like general BSD numbers, but that, that's all encompassing the OS. And I wanted the specific uh, BSD uh, kernel numbers. And so what I did is I sort of scraped the FreeBSD, OpenBSD, NetBSD numbers and sort of put them into a nice little table. Um, and if you look at the um, tables here for uh, the BSDs, you'll see that the first couple of years, they're kind of on par with Linux, but then the Linux ones kind of explode. Um, and the, but the BSD ones will sort of more or less stay the same, um, either single digits or low teens. Uh, it doesn't really go over 17, and that's, that was only OpenBSD a year ago. Um, so if you look at these numbers, uh, Tia's observation was pretty, a pretty astute observation. Um, in fact, uh, 20 was a low estimate. Um, it turns out it was significantly more. Um, and so you see that numbers for BSD and Linux over the years 
are not the same, we're not on the same level. Um, and so what I asked is, are they on equal footing? Like, um, obviously there's a really large community uh, behind the Linux kernel. If you look at the, the BSDs, it's, you know, it's a small group of developers, a small group of users that are using these things and compiling them themselves and, and so forth. Um, and so I wonder if, if, if that is, if that's the reason or if there is a reason why the numbers aren't the same, or if it really is, as Tio said, if it's code quality. And obviously one of the things I consider is, well, maybe it's the many eyeballs thing. And I know there's, many eyeballs thing is, you know, um, very convoluted thing, but, but there's some truth to that. Um, and so I was wondering if, if there's some truth to it in this case. Um, well, and the only way to really do that is to, um, to test it, to, to go and see what, 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 the, what the code is really like. Um, and um, sure enough, there's a guy that did this uh, 15 years ago, uh, Silvio, um, and he did a black hat presentation about this um, 2003, uh, 14 years ago. Um, and uh, basically he, he did an audit of the BSDs and Linux kernel and sort of drew some clues from that. And one of the things uh, that he said was, he said, um, well, there really isn't much difference between uh, the Linux kernel and the BSD kernels in terms of um, security auditing. Um, they're equally-ish broken. It's easy enough to find bugs in both of them and the same kind of bugs. Um, now, that was 15 years ago. Um, that, uh, have things changed since then? Um, the other thing he said was that um, he only spent a couple of days on BSDs and then three months on, on Linux. Um, and so um, if you had spent longer on the BSDs, would that have, would you have gotten more bugs or would you sort of hit, hit a limit, right? And then the third one is sort of the, uh, if you look at his presentation, and this is 15 years ago, uh, he mostly looked for, um, or mostly found uh, trivial integer overflows and, and uh, info leaks and nothing else. And so. The other thing I had is, what if I expand the number of bugs I look for? What if I also look for, you know, uh, race conditions and things like that? Um, and so um, the data is interesting, but it's, it's kind of a little bit outdated and, and uh, a bit too limited. Um, at the time, I think it was perfect. Uh, for today's purposes, it, it's not quite good enough. Um, and so the only way to really figure out if, if those numbers line up or don't line up, what the reason behind it is, is I have to dig in myself. And so. I spent April, May, June, and July of this year um, looking at BSD kernel code. Um, I don't know exactly how much time I spend on each one of them, but I would say they're more or less equal. Um, um, and so basically what I did is I asked myself, if I was gonna look for bugs, where would the bugs be? Where do I think they would make mistakes? Um, and so I made a list of sort of attack surfaces that I, I wanted to go look at. Um, and, and none of these are, I think, overly surprising, obviously. the. The common stuff is like, yeah, obviously I'm gonna take a look at some syscalls and I'll take a look at the TCP stack and then, yeah, I'll take a look at some drivers and I'll look at the compat code and the trap handlers and the file systems and, you know, other networking stuff. Um, and I essentially spend three-ish months looking at that. Um, and so I'll, I'll, I, what I wanna do is I wanna jump over some of the things that uh, in each of those uh, uh, areas that I found and then sort of discuss that uh, um, briefly. And I have a couple of demos in here as well. Um, and then once I've run through that, um, I'll sort of run you through my results and my conclusions. Um, so yeah, so let's dive into system calls. Um, obviously this is prime attack, uh, attack surface. Um, I don't think it should be any surprise to anybody that, uh, you know, if you're looking for security bugs, the first thing you wanna do is look at system calls because that's the thing where user talks to kernel. Um, and the first thing that, uh, that you can see or can observe is that, um, uh, among the three big BSDs, there's a difference in the amount of system calls that are implemented. Right? FreeBSD has well over 500, NetBSD has almost 500, and uh, OpenBSD has you know, uh, about 300 and change. Um, so right then and there, there's a, a clear difference between the tax surface between the three of them, right? Um, but, but even sort of regardless of tax surface, my assumption was, um, given that these are so obvious and so well tested, um, they're less likely to contain security bugs. And so, you know, I go along and I start looking and I start looking at system calls and I start playing around with them. And, and sure enough, this is an OB system call um, and it's the census log and you get to give it a number of bytes and basically that um, gets passed on eventually to malloc. And um, the thing about um, ancient BSD code, OB still has this, if you pass an unbound length to malloc, you get an instant kernel panic. Um, and sure enough, that's what happens. If you do syslog and you give it a really long value, poof, the thing blows up. Um, and I actually have a, a demo of this. I don't know how this is gonna work on the screens. Let's see if I can get this to work. Uh, well. 
It's not mirroring on my screen, so it's kind of annoying to, to, to see this. Hold on. Uh, okay. So there's OpenBSD, and this is uh, my little syslog example. And sure enough, boom, that causes a kernel panic. Hmm. Okay. Um, so yeah, well, that's the syslog, and that's the kernel panic. There you go. And so what's happening is basically, you know, uh, 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 you use the, the, the syslog, syscall, and you pass an unbound value and it causes a, a panic in malloc. Um, this is NoteBSD 6.1. Um, I haven't looked at the later ones. I know it's been fixed since, um, but it's, it's, it's been there since OBS 6.0, so it's a fairly uh, recent uh, bug. Um, so, and here's a second example. This is a, a system call on FreeBSD called uh, KLD stat, which basically gives you statistics about loaded uh, kernel uh, drivers. Um, and this thing basically, um, Creates, has this uh, stat buff from the stack, um, fills it out, and then sends it back to user land. Uh, but it doesn't fill out everything, and so you get uninitialized uh, uh, bytes in there. Um, this has been, uh, I found it in FreeBSD 11, uh, but it's been in there for uh, over, uh, just over a decade. Um, doesn't fully initialize a, a, a structure and basically sets it back um, to uh, user land. And then, uh, hold on, I, let me see if I can show you a demo of this too. Uh, this is KLD leak, and then, oops. And then basically all these bytes are uninitialized kernel memory that's basically flashing over the screen. <clears throat> uh, so that's, uh, uh, that's basically bug number two where you get to basically leak a whole bunch of uh, um, uh, uninitialized kernel memory. Um, so basically, my previous assumption was wrong, right? When I said um, that I assumed that because there are system calls and they're so well tested, um, that it's like, less likely to see bugs in them, well, that turns out to be entirely wrong. Um, you can find bugs in, in uh, system calls in the BSDs um, within, you know, fa fairly quickly, fairly easily, um, bugs that aren't too esoteric or too, too weird, uh, fairly straight, straightforward bugs, um, especially newly added system calls, but even the older stuff, um, as you can see, a 10-year-old system call in FreeBSD um, still had a, a trivial uh, uh, info leak. So those things do occur. Right, so now that we know uh, there are bugs in system calls and they're fairly easy to find, let's move on to the TCIP stack. Um, this one, again, my assumption is it's very well tested and less likely to have bugs because, as we all know, the BSD TCIP stack has been around for ages, since the 80s at least, and it's incredibly well tested and um, highly unlikely to find bugs in there. Uh, and for those who don't know what TCIP stack is, well, it has things like IPv4 and IPv6 in there, and UDP, TCP, ICMP, uh, IPsec, uh, Ethernet, and things like that. Um, it's been around forever, um, and so my assumption is unlikely to have bugs in there. So I start looking around, and I find uh, something in OpenBSD stack, which basically uh, um, uh, parses PPoE, uh, packets, and then uh, it's a little bit uh, convoluted, I guess. Um, but basically the idea is that um, you take a packet, you start parsing it, and then if it um, contains the exact right tag and, and the right error message, uh, basically it um, basically does this thing uh, where, uh, uh, so oh, in, in the BSDs, uh, the way these PS stack works, they have this thing called mbuffs, and it's basically, it's buffer management around data that you send um, in and out, um, and so there's a whole bunch of APIs around it, right? And the idea is that if you don't use the APIs correctly, uh, things go re really wrong. And so in this case, you see this uh, thing called M pull down. And basically, um, if M pull down fails, um, it will free the M buff you passed it. And in this case, you'll see, oh, if M buff fails, there's error code where basically they do go to done. And then in done, they basically um, free the M buff, except if the thing failed, uh, the M buff's already freed. Um, so this is, uh, uh, even though the code's a little bit convoluted to read, it's a relatively easy bug to trigger. Um, it affects OBSD 6.1, uh, but it has been there since 2004, so it's been around for over a decade. Um, 
it turns out when I was looking at this and I found the bug, I checked, also checked NetBSD, and it turns out the NetBSD guys had the same bug, but they fixed it, uh, but they never released any kind of advisory for it. Um, and so clearly they never told you OMBZ guys about it. And so uh, um, they fixed, only fi OMBZ guys only fixed it when I emailed them about it. Um, and so this bug was, I mean, if you know what you know you're looking for, um, this bug was relatively easy to find. And so again, my previous assumption was wrong. Um, bugs in the GCIP stack do occur uh, with some frequency, uh, in particular newer code, uh, but also uh, it turns out M buffs are hard, um, very complicated, and it's error prone. Uh, the APIs aren't overly consistent. Um, about half of them, sort of, when they fail, they free the buff. The other half, when they fail, they don't free the buff. Things like that, where um, it turns out, uh, if you have to use buffs, uh, it's it's not quite that easy. You have to really know what you're doing. And, and uh, there's a number of cases that I found um, where that doesn't happen. Um, and I'll sort of circle back to um, uh, buff um, a misuse uh, later on when I talk about the Wi-Fi stack. Um, but anyway, the TCP stack uh, turns out has bugs. Um, all right, so moving on, uh, I looked at some of the drivers, obviously, because it turns out that um, there's a whole lot of drivers among the BSDs um, for all sorts of things, really. Um, and, and given that uh, Unix has a thing where everything is a file, the way you find your drivers is you go to dev, and then in dev it'll have some kind of name. And then you can do file, you open them, and then you can do file operations on, 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 on that thing, right? So open, read, write, close, and so forth. Uh, but obviously, IOCTL um, is the one uh, that you want to look at, because um, that's generally where most of the uh, interesting attack surface will be. Um, so this is, um, this is the dev crypto on NetBSD, um, which has this thing where they you know, um, basically have this uh, very, very trivial intro flow, and then here you get memory corruption. Um, and it's not, this is just one snippet, but if you look at the actual driver, it's like uh, uh, IOCTL command bug, IOCTL command same bug, IOCTL command same bug, seven or eight times the same trivial intro flow shows up. Um, and then, you know, sure enough, you trigger it. So the, the one I showed was this, uh, this IOCTL, uh, but there are seven or eight others. And then, again, let me see if I can, uh, if I can demo this. Mm. Yeah, that thing's still running. No, nope. I mean, it, it'll leak curl memory till the end, till the end of time. Um, it won't actually crash because the, the memory's guaranteed to be there, it's just an uninitialized. Um. Uh. So this is NetBSD, and then Crypto Overflow, and then boom, sure, the moment I hit this, you get memory corruption. And obviously. <laughs> um, yeah, so basically, this is a classic control flow leading to memory corruption. This is uh, definitely exploitable. Um, and then uh, this is a, a similar driver one. This is FreeBSD. This is a driver called uh, KSIM. Uh, which basically gives you access, it shows you kernel symbols for FreeBSD. Uh, it's an optional driver you can load. Um, and they have this interesting thing where, you know, they do, they implement the open system call, when they do open, they basically, in the, um, the, the driver, files, uh, driver file descriptor specific uh, data, they basically take a copy of a pointer uh, that's very specific uh, to your process. Um, and then when you do nmap, they, they find that pointer and they basically use it. Um, there is an interesting uh, issue here with expired pointers where if, you, if I open uh, the device and then I pass that file script along to a different process and I kill the original process and then that other process does an mmap, it's basically using that original pointer to the original process, but the original process is dead, so you have this wild pointer that's being used. Um, this is essentially an expired pointer. Um, and this is very problematic, uh, it turns out. Um, because you basically, yeah, you're using a wild pointer that can point anywhere to read and write to. Um, and, uh, and I wanted to, I can't really demo this in, in, in the, uh, live because my export kind of sucks and it takes three or four days to actually hit the bug. Um, I could probably optimize it, I just haven't. Um, and so you'll have to do it with a, a, a screenshot. Uh, but this is essentially uh, what happens uh, if you hit the bug. Uh, and then sure enough, uh, yeah, if you look at this here, uptime uh, uh, nine days, uh, one hour, so it took nine days to actually hit the bug. Uh, but I did hit it. <laughs> right, so that's it for the driver stuff. Uh, and there are many, many, many more driver examples, but I figured two's enough. 
Um, so uh, Compact code is this thing in the BSDs where basically um, they allow uh, the OS to sort of emulate a different OS. So if you have a binary uh, that you can file for Linux and you run it on FreeBSD and you turn on a FreeBSD Linux uh, compatible emulation layer um, and, and you make sure that you have the right shared libraries and stuff installed, um, then your Linux binary will run perfectly or more or less perfectly um, on, on your FreeBSD or, or NetBSD. Um, and so they have these kind of, they have the, and they have these OS behaviors uh, for different operating systems. Um, and so especially NetBSD has quite a few of them. Uh, um, FreeBSD has less of them and then OpenBSD pretty much killed most of them. Um, but it's essentially there for either different OSs or older versions of the OS, or you know, you have 64-bit and you're supporting 32-bit versions of the OS. It, it, all that stuff goes through the compat layer. Um, and basically, uh, that stuff basically has to emulate a whole bunch of system calls. Um, and when you, uh, I found a really nice quote by uh, Tio about the compat layers where he says, well, you know, the people that rely on the compat layers uh, don't care enough to maintain it, and the people who uh, work on main systems don't care about compat layers because they don't use them, and the cultures aren't aligned in the same direction. Um, and he basically says, compat layers rot very quickly. And that is absolutely true, and so I'll give you an example of this is this is SVR4 compat code on uh, um, NetBSD. SDR4 is ancient. Nobody use, nobody's used that thing probably in 20 years. Uh, but it's there, and they support it. And this is, they use this thing called streams, which is, uh, it's kind of like sockets, but not. Uh, and streams have been dead for a long time. Um, but NetBSD still supports it in SDR4 for compat. Um, and they have this thing where um, basically the, this uh, <coughs> um, this function, uh, net adder, sock adder, in, uh, gets called uh, with this uh, uh, BND pointer, and basically um, the content of which um, come is, is defined by uh, user land, and what they do is they basically you know, grab a value out of, off of it, use it as an offset, and then basically sort of dereference the thing and read data out of it. Um, so this is basically arbitrary, you know, read anything from memory, uh, out of bound read, um, that uh, obviously can cause uh, uh, um, a kernel crash or potentially info leak. Uh, but the really interesting thing about this code is if you scroll all the way up and you look at the comments, it says, yes, this is gross. <laughs> so they know their code sucks. Um, this code has been around since 1996. Uh, it's <laughs> so it's been there for 20 years. I mean, there may be people in the room that are younger than this bug. Um, uh, but um, yeah, this is, this is really crappy code, and this is what Tia meant when he said uh, combat code rots really quickly. Uh, they wrote it 21 years ago, they never looked back, it's there. Probably hasn't been used since 1996 too. Um, and then, so when I told them about it and they fixed it, uh, the log message basically said, uh, well, we fixed a multitude of holes in SVR4 stream code, um, and then they said, we should have never enabled this by default, uh, and then it's a minefield. And so one of the things I got them to do is, um, when they fixed this thing, they also changed their kernel config, and they turned this shit off by default. Um, which, you know. <laughs> right, so the next thing I looked at are uh, um, trap handlers. And the thing about trap handlers is that, um, so trap handlers basically do this thing where they handle any kind of sort of exception or fault, which can be division by zero or system call or break point or invalid memory access, or a very, very long list of things. Um, and this is essentially mostly this, this sort of hardware sort of coming to your OS and saying, hey, this kind of fault happened, and you have to deal with it. Um, some can be triggered by user land, some can only be triggered by hardware, some can only be triggered by kernel. Um, the, the code to handle this and deal with this is, is usually incredibly, incredibly nasty. Um, it's, it's terrifying to just read this code. I can't imagine writing it. Um, and it's, it's very architecture specific. Like, you know, the Intel ones are different from the R, which is very different from MIPS and so on. And even amongst, you know, the Intel earlier to later, there's many changes in between. Um, and so I didn't really feel um, like uh, auditing this code because I, I, I like my sanity. Um, and so I was like, okay, uh, well, how about I just fuzz it? Well, and, and then so it comes down to, okay, well, how do you fuzz uh, exceptions? And I'm like, well, um, I don't really know how to fuzz specific exceptions, but what if I just execute random instructions? Surely um, those things will hit some kind of exception. Um, and when I say random instructions, I mean like super random. Like, I don't even know what the instructions are. Basically what I do is I read from def view random, and then I end that page, I make it read while executable, fork off a process, basically set a function pointer to it, let that process do its thing, it will die. Uh, usually after instruction two or three, the thing is dead. Uh, but you just keep doing that in a loop, in a loop, in a loop. Um, and it generates all sorts of weird uh, traps that the kernel now has to handle. Um, 
And sure enough, if you do this on, that, on, on FreeBSD, uh, you, you hit a couple of bugs. There's a, 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 a Zen null ref, even though I wasn't using Zen, there's some send signal bug, there's all sorts of weird things that happen. So this is one of them, uh, this is another one of them. Um, and I, I, I could demo it, but I don't, the thing is, because it's so random, you never know when, when it hits. Um, but essentially, this is all the code it takes. I mean, I have more advanced versions of this, but this is really all it takes to cause it. Um, so if you just write something like this and you run it on, on the BSDs and, you know, it, it will hit kernel bugs. Uh, anyway, that's it for trap handlers and I'm happy with that because uh, I don't want to talk more about trap handlers. Um, so yeah, the next thing I was looking at are um, uh, um, file systems. Um, and so the attack server and file systems, obviously the, the easy part of the attack surface is sort of the, um, oh, well, you know, you mount a USB stick or whatever, and then it has to parse the file system. And that's true, I believe, in my view, that's attack surface. But it turns out, in recent years, um, there's significantly new attack surface to file systems. Um, and this comes in the form of uh, Fuse. I don't know if you guys know what Fuse is. It's essentially um, uh, user land file systems. Um, and so what that means is all of a sudden, all these uh, Unix VFS layers that have been around for many, many years that uh, in previous years only took data from uh, trusted drivers in kernel where the data structures were, you know, more or less trusted, like the data in there you figured was more or less accurate because it was given to you by kernel. All of a sudden, all that data is handed to the VFS layer by a user land process, uh, and the assumption that the data in there is trusted is no longer valid. Um, and so if you start looking at the Fuse implementations for the BSDs, the first thing I thought was like, oh, well, it's Fuse, it's BSD, sure, it's one implementation, and, and they all do the same thing. Well, it turns out that isn't true. It turns out all three BSDs wrote their entirely different uh, Fuse implementations. Uh, there is no code shared between all three of them. They're all entirely different. Um, my understanding is, my view of, from looking at the code is that the NetBSD one is the most complete in terms of features. Uh, the FreeBSD one seems to be the one where Arguments are the most controlled and constrained in terms of the amount of validation being done. And then the OpenBSD one is basically um, the, has the most minimal amount of uh, uh, um, imp implementation or features implemented compared to the other two. Um, uh, if you look at Fuse, it actually supports IOCTL, but uh, all three implementations of these do not implement IOCTL. But they implement pretty much any other uh, file system operation. Read, write, you know, read their get attributes, set attributes, that type of stuff. Um, and so, uh, for example, this is, um, this is the OpenBSD uh, get, get CWD uh, um, system call, it gets called by system call, and basically they'll, they'll do this thing where they go to the VFS layer and they say, get attribute, and then they fill out this uh, 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 vatr uh, structure, um, and they assume everything in the vatr structure is more or less sane because it came from a kernel driver. Uh, but given that you now use Fuse, all data in VA is no longer trusted. It should be considered uh, tainted and you should validate it. And of course they don't, and so they take this massive length value from it and they pass it to malloc. And as I, as I mentioned before, the OMBZ malloc, when it sees a very large value, goes kernel panic. Um, so this right here was a bug. And then if you look a little bit further in, in get CW, uh, CWD, um, they'll do another uh, call to the VFS layer, this uh, uh, FOP read there, and basically, um, they get this, uh, IO, this UIO structure back. Um, and uh, previously, when you, when you did that kind of read there, um, again, it, 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 was, it was file system data, uh, but it was handed back from uh, um, an in-kernel file system driver, so the structure was more or less trusted. Um, and in this case, it's really just a buffer and, and a length. Um, and so the content, because it now comes from a user land process, is no longer trusted. And so if you look at what it starts parsing, um, the name length of an entry in a directory, um, it sort of just uh, assumes that it's more or less valid. Um, and then it uh, uses that for a mem move, um, and that can cause an out of bound read. Um, so basically, the problem with Fuse, and I would imagine you see this in Linux too, but I haven't looked yet, is that um, your VFS, you have to, if, you, if you do, if you implement something like Fuse, you have to modify your VFS layer because VFS, your VFS layer has all these assumptions where it assumes the data it gets from your file system is valid and it's no longer true. So that was a sample of what is the, um, but the other BSDs had, had similar bugs. Um, this, this, this particular bug, uh, the bug was there since 2006, but I, I, I think Fuse is not quite that old, and so this has only recently been uh, a, a real issue. And then obviously if you look at the actual file system handler, when you give it a, a, file, a, um, a blob of data that you mount, so this is the X2 parser um, 
for uh, FreeBSD. And this is, I brief, very briefly looked at this. I did not do an exhaustive uh, search, but I was like, you know, grep for this thing called bread. And I'm like, oh, well, you're looking for some kind of string and if the string isn't there, you just panic. Well, that's pretty bad. Basically, I can, I can just give you a, a, a malicious X2 partition and, and this thing will, will cause a panic. Um, so um, obviously the, um, the file system parsers um, in the BSDs are not what they should be. Um, I suspect if you throw a simple file system fuzzer against these things, it'll blow up in all sorts of bizarre and weird ways. Um, I literally just spent five minutes on this and I was like, this is very, very broken. Because uh, clearly they're assuming valid file systems. Um, again, this, this bug's been there for, I don't know, seven or eight years or so. Um, but I suspect once you start hammering on the file systems, you'll, you'll find more bugs. <clears throat> right. Um, so yeah, uh, networking beyond TCP IP stack. Um, and I, 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 I sort of mentioned uh, uh, BT, Wi-Fi, and URDA, but I really only um, have Wi-Fi in my slides. The other two I kind of threw out because uh, I, didn't, I didn't get to it. Um, but when you look at the Wi-Fi attack surface, um, there are uh, sort of um, really two things you have to look at, right? One is the stack itself, and then one are the, the actual Wi-Fi drivers, right? And ideally, you want to have this thing where you have only one stack and then all the drivers sort of call into it, which is what the BSDs did, and Linux has this too. But in early days of uh, Wi-Fi, sort of every driver came with its own full stack. Um, but luckily, we're sort of past that, and there's, only, there's one stack for, it, for all the drivers. Um, so yeah, the stack is sort of, it, it looks like the TCP stack. I mean, it it's obviously parses different protocols, but it's all in buffs, it's in and out, it's stuff that gets passed uh, back and forth. Um, the main uh, input function is, is IEEE 802.11 underscore input, um, and once you start reading that, you sort of find the entire you know, 802.11 parsing stack. And that function is called from all uh, the Wi-Fi drivers. Um, and so, sure enough, if you start reading that, eventually you find this function called IEEE 802.11 um, underscore epol underscore key underscore input, and this basically uh, deals with epol keys. Um, and it turns out, if you look at the structure for this thing, it actually has two different lengths. One is length and one is payload length. Uh, and this, this, uh, this particular uh, function does validate length and payload length, but then it has to do this thing called a, an mbuff pull-up. That, that is to say, it has to actually pull up enough um, continuous buffers to make sure there's that much length. And it does this for the payload length, but not for the actual, the other length field. And so, um, turns out that um, the actual length field is used to actually read beyond the thing, uh, to read the buffer. And so, uh, because it, the pull-up isn't done for the length, but for the payload length instead, um, if your length is bigger than your payload length, then you can end up having out-of-bound reads. Uh, and this can be triggered by you know, uh, remote uh, uh, Wi-Fi frames. Um, so again, this comes back to uh, MBUF uh, mis mishandling. As I said previously in the TCP IP stack part, um, MBUFs are hard. Um, this uh, was not OpenBSD 6.1 when I was auditing it, um, but it turns out the bug's been around for uh, about nine years. Um, the drivers, uh, so they, the, the Wi-Fi drivers, this is the interesting part. Um, the Wi-Fi drivers are either, so Wi-Fi drivers in BSDs are either PCI or USB, right? Um, so PCI is, you know, when you put the card in and it basically has DMA access, uh, but USB is different. USB is packet-based, right? And so it comes out to the question uh, where it's like, do you trust your Wi-Fi radio, right? What if somebody compromises the Wi-Fi radio and then from there on tries to own your OS? Um, um, and so for the PCI one, I was like, okay, well, if, if you're PCI, okay, it's kind of game over because they can do DMA. Um, and that's, I mean, that's no longer true when you use things like the IOMMU, uh, but let's just assume that if, if it's PCI and you handle it wrong, okay, fine. Um, but when it comes down to the, the USB drivers rated 211, um, the USB protocol is essentially packet-based, and so um, your USB host really should be able to, you know, parse the packets correctly and not blow up if you get uh, bizarre USB packets uh, from your uh, uh, Wi-Fi radio. Um, it turns out that they're currently not really doing that, um, and this leads to very, very trivial heap smashes. And I have, uh, I wanted to have one example, but I really gave you five examples of like the same thing. Um, so this is one driver where they go like, okay, there's a, a length field that can be up to uh, a page long, and then, uh, okay, we'll go do, uh, we'll create an MBuff cluster, which, which can be 2,000 bytes long, and then we'll just do a mem copy with that length into that cluster without ever validating if that length is bigger than a cluster. And obviously that means uh, you get trivial memory corruption. And then this is a different Wi-Fi driver, and they say, okay, let's grab this length field out of the out of the uh, USB uh, packet, 
and then we'll basically use that and copy into uh, a, 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 an MBUF that can be up to 2,000 2, bytes. And again, very similar heap corruption bug. And then this is another driver, and it's a very similar thing with a, a mem copy with a length. And then this is another driver, very similar thing, where they, do, they take a length, they do an M, a mem copy, and it causes a, 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 an, uh, an MBUF uh, heap corruption bug. Uh, and and uh, there's more of these, but those are the ones that were very trivial. Um, so this is basically wide open attack surface um, across all BSDs, across various different. Uh, I mean, there's an Atmel, there's a Realtek, there's a whole bunch of these uh, um, uh, um, Wi-Fi drivers. <coughs> um, the, the, yeah, these, the, this code is very trusting of the USB packets. It just assumes everything is done right. Um, I think when when these drivers were implemented, nobody thought about the attack surface on this one. Um, and then, uh, so that's more or less it for the, uh, um, for the attack surface I had. Um, there's a few more things I looked at and I kind of want to talk about. Um, like I didn't really have much detail about it, but so two things that, that I showed up that, that, that I sort of had um, that, that, that were, seemed like there were many bugs in there. So one is um, there appeared to be an, um, a certain amount of uh, easy detectable null DRFs um, in the BSDs. Um, I spent some time looking at it in FreeBSD. I, uh, I did a very quick rep on, 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 the, on that NetBSD, but I, I suspect there's a similar amount um, on, on, on NetBSD. Where basically, so the way you call malloc on the BSDs basically is you pass it a flag, and the flag is either basically says um, no weight or um, uh, 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 so I think the default behavior is that it, it could, the default behavior is that the malloc uh, always waits, and when it succeeds, when it returns, it always su succeeds. It never fails. Um, and but there's a way you can pass the flag, which is no wait or can fail. And what that means is if it can't um, uh, fulfill the request within a, a certain amount of time, it returns and it fails the request. Right. And so what you can do is you basically grab for these flags, and you see any time where there's a malloc done and a return value is in check, then you get a null ref. Um, and the reason these things show up is because by default, um, the, the pattern is malloc and not check return value. And you would think, okay, well, that's an easy pattern. And no, if you're writing kernel code, you would never make that kind of mistake, except because the, the general way malloc is called is where it can never fail. And so there's almost never a malloc return value check. Um, except you have to do this when you're doing uh, uh, no wait or can't fail. And it turns out there is, thank you. Um, turns out there are uh, quite a few cases where uh, when you do uh, malloc, no wait or can't fail, people don't check return value. And uh, so I think these are pretty grippable in static analysis wise. Um, and I don't know why people haven't done this yet, um, but uh, there's quite a few. Uh, I think I, I brief, so when I did grep on that I think I had like 15 or 20. I can't remember how long the list was on, the, on, the, on a FreeBSD. Um, another thing that was interesting to see is that um, the, the BSDs have, uh, you know, this direct rendering uh, uh, stuff in kernel, right? Direct rendering manager, direct rendering, direct rendering infrastructure. Uh, for those who don't know, these are basically the graphics drivers that are in kernel. And so when X11 runs, it sort of talks to these graphics drivers in kernel. And that the whole thing around it is called DRM or DRI. Um, and so this sort of, because this sort of came from the open desktop people, and it was initially developed separate, and then uh, a couple of years ago, it was moved into the Linux kernel, uh, and then what the BSDs did is they kind of forked it, but it's essentially more or less the same code base. Um, and so, the B but the BSD guys kind of have to have it, otherwise X doesn't really do much anymore these days. Um, and so, uh, it's interesting when you see the struggles they have with this. Um, and if you look at the, the, the main OpenBSD developer who's responsible for maintaining DRM, DRI, and in OpenBSD, he said, well, he goes, all this Linux code that we are importing, uh, it's not going to be reviewed by any of the OpenBSD kernel developers because they refuse to read any code that is not conforming to the BSD KNF standard. Um, and so you have all of these uh, rigorous uh, code review standard practices on OpenBSD, except all this DRM, DRI stuff, uh, they will not touch it. And so all the badness you see there in Linux kernel, all that stuff is pretty much in OpenBSD and NetBSD and FreeBSD as well. Okay, so that was sort of it for um, running through uh, um, the sort of the, the types of bugs I was looking for and the things I found. Um, I mean, I could have spent, I could have done another two, three hours running through a bunch of bugs, but you know, it'd get pretty boring. Um, so it, uh, so what's, what was my result? Um, after I was done, uh, about three-ish months, um, I had about 115 bugs in total, um, uh, 30 bugs in FreeBSD, about 25 bugs in uh, OpenBSD, and uh, the lion's share was in that BSD. So 
uh, about 60 or so in uh, NetBSD. Um, it was a, a very wide spectrum of bugs, pretty much everything you can, under the sun that you can expect, right? A, a straight up heap stack smashes, race conditions, expired pointers, double freeze, uh, integer issues, underflows, overflows, sinus bugs, logic bugs. I had a typo somewhere where the wrong variable was used, but it turns out that one existed too, and then you had these weird things where the wrong thing was happening on the wrong structure because there was a typo. Um, division by zero, I had some logic bugs in there. I mean, pretty much anything you can imagine is in there. Um, it turns out kernel code is not written by gods, and they too make mistakes. And they make plenty of mistakes, actually. Um, so uh, I, I found basically bugs amongst all three BSDs, uh, amongst all of the attack servers I mentioned, and within that entire spectrum. Um, but it's interesting, once I sort of got a grasp for all three of them and what was where and how it was done, um, it, it's interesting to that I, I think I can make some observations about the code quality. Um, and just looking at the bugs, like just the numbers of the bugs, right? You can, you can, you can see the same thing, right? Um, and so there's sort of a, uh, I think OpenBSD, when it comes to code quality in their kernel, is the, the clear winner, right? Um, and it comes, at, the quote that I had from uh, um, the original where, where it says, oh, it's code quality, um, that's part of it. Um, I think uh, it, it's, it became obvious to me that it, it's, it's code quality, but also a tax reduction. It's a combination of those two that um, uh, uh, seems to, to, to be a, a winning formula. Um, and in OpenBSD, there is enormous tax reduction. If you compare it with the other BSDs, there are many things they do not have. They don't have loadable kernel modules. They have relatively few devices. They have virtually no compat code. Uh, they removed their loose compat code a couple of years ago. Um, they removed their entire uh, Bluetooth stack because they thought the code sucked and they just deleted it. So no Bluetooth support on OpenBSD. Um, they have significantly less system calls. They have more than 200 system calls less than FreeBSD. Um, and they cut support for a whole bunch of old architectures, right? Uh, and, and that in combination with code quality, um, uh, I think is a winning uh, formula. Uh, the code quality is interesting because it really does show, if you look at the code, right, the trivial low-hanging fruit stuff is almost entirely gone to OpenBSD. Integer overflows, uh, sinus bugs are virtually gone in OpenBSD. There's like the, the Wi-Fi driver stuff is something where I still found it because it was attack surface they never thought about. But anything that they know is attack surface, uh, it, it's highly unlikely you find integer overflows there or sinus bugs uh, simply because they know about them. Uh, they, um, in, they inform uh, their developers about what that looks like and they have this um, every, every commit gets code reviewed by at least one or two people. And these people know exactly what these patterns look like. And it turns out when you have a process like that, um, integer overflows simply don't occur in an attack surface. Um, the other thing is that they had fewer info leaks than the other BSDs. Um, in terms of the clear loser, yeah, uh, that was OpenBSD. Um, I think you can see that in these bugs. I mean, they have 60, the other two combined is less. So yeah, it was, it was an app BSD. Uh, tons of legacy code, tons of compact code. Um, yeah, it turns out when you have uh, legacy and compact code, when you have code that was written in 96 and you haven't looked at it since, yeah, you're going to have bugs. Um, they have these ISO protocols in there, which I don't know if anybody actually uses those these days. It's really ancient code from the 80s, which is written by IBM, and then it was imported in NetBSD, and it's been there ever since, and nobody knows what it does, but it's there. Um, and a whole bunch of this really, really old code. Um, the other thing is that uh, their code seems to be less consistent um, with security, qual uh, security code quality compared to the other BSDs. Um, unlike OpenBSD, they have tons and tons and tons of initial issues and sightness bugs. Uh, they're quite, I mean, just that one I actually showed that, you know, eight initial overflows right there. Um, so, so there is definitely that sort of code quality difference. Um, and I don't mean that as a diss. I mean, I understand that, I mean, Building, maintaining, improving OS is really, really hard. And if you think it's easy, you know, try it. Um, so I understand that it's very hard doing OS, um, but there is a clear difference between if you if you look at one and you look at the other, you can see there's a there's a difference in code quality um, when you look at the attack surface. Um, and then FreeBSD is somewhere in between, really. Um, it's hard to place it, but it, it it's it's not it's not the code quality isn't as bad as NetBSD, but it's not as good as OpenBSD. Um, so, okay, so obviously when I found these bugs, I, um, I talked to the teams and I sent them emails and I said, hey, here's a list of bugs I have. You guys should probably go and find this, uh, fix this. Um, so I email uh, the OpenBSD guys and, you know, Theo gets back to me, I don't know, about a week or so later. And the first thing he does, he says, oh, I'm sorry, it took me a week to get back to you. I was on vacation. 
Um, and he says, oh, these bugs look good. Uh, this is definitely problematic. We should go and fix these things. And then he says, uh, he emails me back and says, in the next two or three days, you should see fixes sort of coming in our CVS. And sure enough, um, uh, 25 or so bugs I reported, less than a week and they fixed all of them, right? Um, yeah, I think that's good. Um, and then a couple weeks later, uh, the OBZ guys basically um, made individual patches and advisory and said, okay, if you have, late, if you have an OB, latest OBZ and you want to fix these bugs, here's the patches, here's how to do it. Um, so I think that was great. I think that's perfect. I think that's the way it's supposed to be, right? Uh, um, sort of the, you know, within a week response, a few days later, things are fixes. Uh, they have fixes in place, and then like a week or two after that, there's all the patches are publicly available. Uh, uh, there's advisories. This is exactly the way... Uh, a security process should work. Uh, OMBZ guys have done everything right as far as I'm concerned. Um, so FreeBSD, how did that go? Well, um, it sort of started off similarly where I got a response within, I don't know, a couple of days, maybe a week. And I got a, a bug back from these guys and said, okay, well, we've seen all your bugs and we filed them in our internal bug database. And this was July 14th. And sure enough, this is from the email. And I've blacked out what hasn't been fixed yet or what I'm not quite sure of. Uh, there's three narratives that have been fixed, right? Um, so um, since that email, um, not all that much has happened, right? It's, it's, it's five months later. Um, two advisors have been released. Um, and so obviously those two bugs have been fixed. And then there's a third one, this uh, ARC E EDCAP. Um, I, I, saw, um, I saw a CVS commit for that. So I know that one's fixed. All the others, I, it's up in the air. I don't think they're fixed. I, I quickly checked CVS right before I came here. Um, they look like they're still in limbo somewhere. Um, so, uh, you know, this is, this is where we're at with FreeBSD. Okay, NetBSD. Um, first of all, when I emailed them these bugs, um, a list of 60 bugs, um, this shit got fixed overnight. Um, <laughs> seriously, seriously. Um, this is obviously unbelievably impressive, right? Um, I don't know how you can do that, but clearly there were two developers that were like, oh, let's fix this shit, let's fix it right now. Um, so that was, that was very impressive. Um, and then as I mentioned, they also turned off the entire SDR, um, SDR4 um, compat subsystem. And if you look at the commit message, said, oh no, the email they sent me said basically, and this is mirrored in the commit message, they said, we've disabled the SDR4 by default, uh, something that should have been done a long time ago. Um, so that is incredibly impressive. Um, that was late July 2017, five months ago. Uh, let, me, let, let me tell you what's happened since. Absolutely nothing. The bugs are fixed in CVS. Um, there are no patches for current. There are no advisories. Um, what this effectively means is if you're running uh, NetBSE today, all 60 bugs are there, and you can go to, CV, to their CVS and um, see exactly what the bug is. Um, so I wish they had followed up with some patches and advisories. Um, so that kind of, it, it started off really, really, really well, and then they kind of dropped the ball. Okay, so coming back to my sort of, uh, um, <clears throat> the earlier, where I began my presentation, the sort of the, okay, are things on equal footing? Um, well, I, I think bugs are still very easy to find in the BSD kernels, probably about as easy as on, in the Linux kernel. Um, even OpenBSD wasn't, I mean, there were certain things I didn't see in OpenBSD, but it wasn't like it was hard to find bugs in there. Um, there's very varying level of quality uh, between the two, uh, or between all three of them. Uh, it depends on the age and who wrote it and under what circumstances. Um, the most consistent set of quality I found by far was OpenBSD. Again, this comes back to their rigorous review process, right? Every, every CVS check-in gets code reviewed. Um, I, I think that's a process that simply just works. Uh, with the exception of the DRI, DRM stuff, um, the OBZ guys have the, the same shitty code everybody else is, and apparently the OBZ developers refuse to touch it. Um, another thing I have, or sort of that I, that I um, uh, think should happen, so because I found I had a couple of bugs where I was like, okay, this bug's not OpenBSD, but it was fixed in NetBSD, or and the other thing around where I'm like, oh, this is NetBSD, but the OpenBSD guy fixed it. 15 years ago, right? So the, those things from time to time did happen with some frequency. Um, and so uh, um, ideally, I think the maintainers of the BSD should talk more amongst each other. Um, now I understand that that's obviously easier said than done because in the last 15 or 20 years, they have diverged and there's, 
different philosophies and ideas on where the BSDs are supposed to go, and obviously, you know, there's big egos involved as well. And so getting these guys to talk isn't always very easy, and it doesn't always make sense. But by and large, I think there's enough commonality still between all the BSDs that it would make sense that when it comes to things that are attack surfaces and, 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 and fixes, it would probably make sense if these guys talked more with each other. Um, uh, the other thing is that obviously uh, when it comes to things, you know, if you look at code base alone, that tells you something about the attack surface, right? OpenBSD's kernel is about 2.8 million lines of code, NetBSD is about 7.3 million, and NetBSD is, and this is 10, this was 11.0, I don't know what the latest one is. The FreeBSD was about 9 million, right? So that alone right there tells you that OpenBSDs can have less bugs because they have less code, right? It's that easy. Um, so obviously this plays a part, right? You can't have a bug in code that you don't have, right? Um, and the other thing is obviously um, sort of accidental versus planned, where if, if I haven't gotten, if I haven't implemented something yet, then you can't have it yet, right? Um, but the other thing is obviously is that the plan where it's choices to make, uh, to delete code on purpose. Um, and this is something you saw in, in OpenBSD where, you know, they chose to delete their Bluetooth stack. They chose to delete their um, uh, Linux compat layer. And obviously, it's a double-edged sword, right? You, you lose functionality, but you gain security. And you try to find that balance. Um, but obviously, you know, cutting code, you know, that generally gives, you know, it, it cuts stack surfs and generally means you have less bugs. Um, right, so, um, yeah, more conclusions. Um, basically, uh, going back to what I, um, the original thing I had, which was the mini eyeballs thing, um, yeah, I think that's a factor. I think it really does matter, right? Um, I think if you have more people looking at something, more bugs are gonna be found. And so I think one of the big reasons why the numbers are off when you compare those tables initially, uh, I, I think a, a large part of it is, you know, more people are looking at the Linux kernel and so they're gonna find more bugs. Code quality, can't explain everything. Um, and, right, I mean, it, you can say what you want about the people writing Linux kernel, but, you know, there are just orders of magnitude people, more people looking at that code. They're just gonna find more bugs. And it shows in the numbers. And, uh, yeah, that's pretty much it. That was frightfully awesome. <laughs> okay, I'm quite convinced you people want to ask a bunch of questions. We got about nine minutes. Um, let's start with you over there. One sentence, one question mark. Well, uh, but uh, thank you for your awesome work and nice presentation. Thank you. And a bunch of questions. First, are you interested in Exploiting. Uh, so you had a crush, mm -hmm. crushes, and how about uh, making a proof of concept? Local uh, privilege escalation or uh, RCE, remote code execution? Yeah, given that I, my plan was to report all the bugs, I saw really no point in writing full blown exploits because it's wasted effort, right? The only, to me, the only way, I mean, if I'm going to write an exploit, I don't like, I don't, I don't want to write an exploit for a bug I know it's going to get killed, right? So I didn't see, I mean, some of these bugs it would have taken me weeks or months to sit down and write code for. Uh, and so I, didn't, I don't think it would have been very useful for me to write full-blown exploits. Um, I, I know there's a shock and awe factor to exploits, and, and at times they can be useful. Um, given my understanding or my assumption that um, the people on the other end I was talking to, people like Theo, uh, that are very knowledgeable in this area, I didn't feel there was any need to write, to write an exploit, and so I didn't. Does that answer your question? Yeah, thanks, but... Um... Uh, showing exploits usually helps to convince people in self-protection technologies, like we have jar security and uh, oh, yeah, self-protection. Absolutely, no, I, I mean, mitigation is obviously not a good thing, and, and, and you know, we should, we should keep uh, innovating and exploring new mitigations. Um, it's just that I don't think this would have contributed much to it. And okay, thank you. There's a question from the internet. Please, let's listen to the dark side. Yes, thank you, the dark side. Um, how would you s suggest to um, improve um, cooperating between the different BSDs? <laughs> That's a good question. Uh, I mean, I don't know. I understand, because I know, uh, uh, I know Tio said a few things about, well, you know, it's not easy to talk to other people because so-and-so. And so, um, yeah, I don't know how to, you know, at the end of the day, get these guys in a room and get them to talk or something. Um, 
uh, obviously there, there, there's uh, uh, there are some differences between the two, and they're not they there are certain things obviously they that you know where there's differences they don't necessarily have to talk to each other, um, but um, I, yeah I can't I don't really know of any specific way to try to massage them to get talk to them to each other. All I, all I can say is find the right maintainers for the right subsystems, and if some guy fi fixes a bug in something where they go, this is a tax surface, you know, reach out to the guy on, on you know, the others, on, you know, the other BSDs and be like, and just send him a, drop him an email and be like, hey guys, maybe you should look at this too. Um, beyond that, I have, I have no, no good answer really. Okay, thank you. Is there another question from the internet? Not yet. Not yet. Um, how about one last question? We got five more minutes. Anybody at the microphone? Ooh, ooh I'm not really seeing anything out there. <laughs> okay. Over there on the left, excuse me. Um, so my question was about methodology. Um, did you use any automated tool or did you do everything by hand? Uh, where's this coming question coming from, by the way? Uh, on the left side. Uh, I didn't yeah, see okay. either. Sorry, in the back. Oh, okay, yeah. Um, yeah, uh, well, uh, I didn't. I, uh, um, 9% of this thing was like straight up reading code. Uh, just, you know, I opened it up in, in uh, an IDE and I was just reading it. Um, there were a couple of times when I used some grep uh, to look for some patterns. Uh, but beyond that, no, it was just me reading code. Um, that was pretty much it. There were no other tools involved. Thanks. <laughs> I think we'll take one more, huh? One more? Sure, yeah. One more here. Didn't you want to? Yeah. Now's your big chance. Uh, uh, could you describe your motivation of spending three months on that work? <laughs> yeah, I, can, I, I know code, code review isn't for everyone. I, I, I think I once heard it described being you know, more boring than watching paint dry. Um, I, I disagree with that. I actually I enjoy writing, uh, reading code. Um, I, I think it's fun. I think there's a, a number of things you can learn from uh, reading code. Um, and it's, it's, you get the sort of interesting sort of kick from it, right? It's like, if I find a bug in piece of, like sometimes you use a piece of code and you're like, oh, like, oh, they screwed this up. Like, I noticed this and they, and they didn't. So there, there's a little bit of that. Uh, but generally, uh, um, yeah, I, I, I generally enjoy it. And I know some people don't. But um, for me, it, was, it wasn't a depth march. It wasn't a stretch. I was, I had no problem. Uh, and then when I say three, three, four months, I mean on and off, because obviously I have work and things, so it's like evenings and weekends. Um, but it wasn't, it wasn't hard, it wasn't difficult. I was just like, okay, let's open up my laptop and I'll spend the next three or four hours looking at you know, the system call or something. Um, I didn't think it was hard. I understand that it's not for everyone, uh, but I, I, I tend to uh, enjoy code review. Thanks again for your work. Awesome. Okay, thank you very much. Am I overseeing a question somewhere? No? Now's your chance. The internet. Yes, the there's one final question from the internet. Um, while the BSDs may not be cooperating, is there at least a common mission statement or any high-level thing they, they could at, at least agree on? Uh, this is a, a non-security BSDs question. I have no idea. I'm, I think there are people here that are probably... Uh, a much better place than I to answer these kind of BSD questions. Yeah, I have no idea. Okay, <clears throat> if that's it, thank you, but let's have enough final hand.